going to give you a quick background of 1 Corinthians. It was written by the apostle whose name was Paul. And if you remember the apostle Paul, he was a bad man. <laughs> Amen. Paul's former life, he was a hit man. He was someone that uh, the, 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 the temple sent out, uh, the Jewish temple sent out to go find Christians and kill them. And he got so good at it that uh, he had a whole little squad. He had a, 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 a what, 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 what do you call it, a Google squad, if you will. And uh, they were going out killing anyone who dared to name the name of Jesus. And they weren't called Christians at the time. They were called followers of the way. It's a little nice little nugget. Everyone in the car said the way, great guy. And uh, Paul uh, was a Saul, was his name was Saul at the time, was on his way to go kill some Christians. And while he was on the road, uh, the Bible says that God knocked Saul off his horse and made an introduction that Saul would never forget. And Saul changed his name to Paul, and Paul ended up becoming one of the most prolific Christian writers. Certainly was one of the most successful church planters. He launched the church in uh, most of the nations that were outside of the kind of Jewish context, if you will. And uh, Paul was uh, very responsible for the church in Corinth. Thus, we have uh, two letters to the Corinthian church. And Paul uh, was writing this first letter, particularly as a response to after he had preached and kind of gathered uh, some of these folk he left and left some people in charge. How many of you know whenever you put more than two or three folk in the same space for a long period of time, you get a lot of drama? Amen. Or you get a little bit, for example. The drama just comes. Amen. Don't be afraid. You know, sometimes the presence of mess is also a signal of life. Amen. You don't see a whole lot of messiness in a, in a cemetery, man, because there ain't a whole lot of stuff going on over there. Amen. So, you just, you know, sometimes, you know, you just got to deal with it as it comes. Paul wrote this letter uh, to the church in Corinth, and uh, the Corinth church, uh, city of Corinth is located uh, in, in a particular part of the Roman Empire. It was a metropolitan city, meaning that there were a whole lot of folk from a lot of different places all kind of descending in the city of Corinth, largely for economic reasons and you know opportunities for a very similar reason why most people come to the cities, right? Because you want to try to make the best of your life, have access to a whole lot of opportunities. But you also found a lot of diversity in the city, a lot of different practices, a lot of different ideas and thoughts. So Paul was trying to make sure that every single follower of Jesus in this city had a clear understanding of what it means to follow Christ and why they are following Christ. And I find it to be a great gift to us today, living in the Bay Area, in particular one of the most diverse places in the world. Uh, always bombarded and sometimes overwhelmed by all of the many differences of thoughts and ideas and opinions and people, uh, amen, uh, that this text for us could in fact be a very important, powerfully instructive text to help us appreciate how we are to live out our faith in such a space. Let us take a look then at the scripture that it is on the screen. It may be in your uh, Bible, uh, page, I think, 923 in the church Bible, if you want to just follow along there. But the word of God, Paul writing to the church in Corinth, verse number 16, chapter number 3, the word of God declares, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. Man, that just shivers up there in my spine. We have to talk about that later. Do some research. God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. So do not deceive yourselves. If you think that you are wise in this age, you should become fools. So that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. I oh, you slave folk out there think you're smarter than God. God said, I know how to get you caught up. <laughs> and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. Verse 21 is kind of going to be the meat of our sermon today. So let no one boast about human leaders. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All belong to you. And you 
belong to Christ. And Christ belongs to God. Word of God. For us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we want to talk about the power of belonging this morning. The power of belonging. Uh, pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read. For us, the people of God, we ask you to hide this word in our heart. So we will not sin against you and send your anointing. Power of your spirit that makes preaching and teaching easy. And rest upon me. The hearers of this word touch my body, my heart, and my soul, my mind. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Ask your neighbor, who do you belong to? Mm. Now, one of the great challenges, I believe, particularly as we live in this moment, post-enlightenment moment, the age of identity, age of social categories, the age where we are constantly being asked to describe who we are. Always got to check your ethnicity or your gender or your, 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 your state of origin. You, you always got to identify yourself. Are in a place and a time where we are always preoccupied with difference. This is a, an important moment, I think, for the church because without a proper appreciation about the true owner of humanity, we can easily find ourselves fighting other people's fights and battles rather than participating in the ongoing, unfolding work of God in the world, that is to reconcile the world back to God. Now, certainly, uh, being a Christian does not always mean that you will be uh, on the right side of this work of reconciling the world back to God. Just necessarily have a category for your name or a title called Christian, pastor, bishop, psalmist, father, sister, brother. How I many you know sometimes the titles don't always reflect the character? It's supposed to be associated with anything. So having a title and having a category is not necessarily that which will distinguish you as a part of this work of reconciliation of making sure that everyone belongs in a place. I have always captivated about the Rwanda genocide. I learned about this first when I was in uh, seminary at Duke University and uh, my professor was a Rwanda, a Ugandan Catholic priest. His mom was from Rwanda, his dad was from Uganda. And he shared with us the history of the Hutu and the Tutsi people, how uh, they were categories that were created uh, by, I think it was, some of the European poet, Brit, no, but Brit, no, like, da, Dutch. My God, who's coming? <laughs> folk that just kind of picked some folk out and, and, and gave people categories based on their facial features. And over several hundred years, these categories became so codified that when the Hutu kind of uh, people rose to enough power, they enacted a retribution, a genocide over 90 or so days when they killed almost a million people. And what's so fascinating about the story to me was not just that they were doing this with such efficient aggression, but that 90% of the country proclaimed themselves to be Christians. And it caused me to ask questions about what is it about the way we form ourselves as Christians, the way we are formed and the way we are shaped, that being a Christian does not seem to be able to trump being an American or Hutu or Tutsi or black or white or, or, or from Hunter's Point and, and East Oakland that you're not Christians in all these different parts, geographic locations, but when the government or your home tells you to take somebody's life, we are quickly willing and able to 
participate. It speaks to me that we have lost one of the major kind of foundational truths of scripture, certainly the gospel, that there is no male or female, Jew or Greek, slave nor free, but all are one in Christ. That we all belong together. Now, it is clear that we have a consistent expression in our current context where there seems to be systematic and structural uh, 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 frameworks that are allowing ourselves uh, to have such a distinguishing interaction or distinguishing difference between ourselves that our interactions rise to levels of lethality and certainly trauma. Trayvon Martin situation, most recent Dunn trial, Jordan Davis remind us that we can be so fixated on our differences and on that which uh, you know, our assumptions about each other that when fear arises, we can be more willing to take a step of lethality rather than a step of reason. Been captivated and disheartened by some of these laws that are being bantered and advocated around over in the motherland, some of our African spaces where they are criminalizing our gay brothers and sisters and trying to suggest some of them should be put in jail, some places even executed, because the way in which they are carrying out their sexuality is an affront to some, and, 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 and how in many respects, Christians can go along for the ride and not over all things prioritize life. Find myself deeply troubled by Jerry Brown, governor of the state of California, who in a meeting we were having together was proudly proclaiming he was a good Franciscan Catholic. Now everybody's a good Catholic, now the Pope Francis is the Pope. You know, everybody wants to be Catholic. I want to be more <laughs> But at the same time, you know, he signed private prison contracts, 30, 40 million dollars. Ship our brothers and sisters in other states under the cloak of night. We won't spend the $300 million he got in his account that was supposed to be spent to help our brothers and sisters come home. Being a Christian don't always mean that you just automatically are going to be on the right side of prioritizing life and making sure that people have a place to belong. Why? Because labels make it easy for us to pick and choose who we belong to. Categories make it easy for us to, to, to construct these boxes and say, you can fit in my box as long as you describe yourself the way I want you to. But can you imagine if God treated us that way? I, for one, am glad that it's up to God when it comes to my alone. Man, you ought to be glad. You know, we be like, well, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about, pastors, you know. Everybody loves me, oh, they know. <laughs> Some of y'all just too scary, they just won't tell you, baby guys. You know, you know, why they touch their person, walk in the other side of the street, every time they see you coming, somebody say amen, right? <laughs> that it is not up to us solely about who belongs to God, but it is always up to God. And this idea and this notion of belonging and of trying to identify who we are is so critical. And it finds itself even in this passage where you see in verse number 22, you have them, uh, you were reading a little bit earlier up in the passage, you see the names Paul, Apollos, and Cephas that even in the early church, they were all starting to divide themselves in a category. Well, I'm a disciple of Paul. And I'm a disciple of Apollos, and I'm a disciple of Cephas, who is Peter. And they were all starting to have conflicts. Why? Because Apollos had a certain presentation of the gospel. That was apologetic, meaning he was always about having certain answers. Then it was a defense of the gospel. So everyone who was prone to argumentation loved to hang out with Apollos. You know, folk who just love to argue all the time. Love to get their point across. You ever been like that? Always have to have a last word? Yeah. Like, well, God bless you. 
not big muscles and you can whoop anybody and come in your, but you still limited. Amen. So I start with God, the limitless one, the one who is omnipotent, omnipotent, omnipotent. <laughs> I'll eat this shit. No, that's, that's some word. <laughs> I start with the one that has everything. Because how many know if you got start with that one, everything you need, you can draw down. Right, right. If you start with yourself, you you limited. You remember how about tell you limited if you start with yourself? Don't believe the hype. The hype ain't true. So the first truth that I want to submit to you today is. So the first truth I find in this passage, particularly Paul is declaring that there is a task that you and I must embrace around how we belong to God. If you will, the, the, the greatest impact of this means that you and I must at all times recognize the humanity of our brother and sister. That there is a dignity that is afforded to every created person that you can pick and choose who you get to love or show humanity to. Because everyone belongs to God. Everyone belongs to God even if they don't think they belong to God. The atheist belongs to God. The agnostic belongs to God. So, 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 because we all belong to God, Thomas Murphy says a 
like this. Be human in this most inhumane of ages. Guard the image of man, for it is the image of God. You and I then must call into question any label, whether it's Cephas, Apollos, Paul, Black, White, American, Ugandan, any label that seeks to separate you and I from one another. Right. Don't mean we ignore our distinctions, but it means that I will not allow my distinctiveness to be that which separates my responsibility to you because we belong to God. Right. And there are great implications to really believe in that folk belong to God. First of which is, God, if you don't help them, they're not going to be helped. All right. Now for someone like me who is a raging codependent, <laughs> feel like I got to fix everything and everybody. I had one of my mentors tell me, hey, Mike, you have to start remembering that these folks belong to God. Yeah. <laughs> so you should do that too, because y'all just, just fix this, this or this is fix it too. Bring it out. Yeah. How, many, how, many, how many of y'all, let me be honest, <laughs> tried to fix somebody this week? Just raise your hand. Yeah. I, I wish I had an honest church in here. <laughs> But when you uh, realize that they belong to God, you realize it's not your responsibility. Yes. Right. It's God's responsibility. Give it a high five and tell them we belong to God. We belong to God. <laughs> now, the, the second thing that I, I think our text says um, is, is in this belonging to God, it is critical for you and I to be careful not to push ourselves beyond our very basic assumptions we have with one another that is often implicit and unconscious. Mm -hmm. Now I'm just gonna do a quick little, 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 little diagram up here because I found this to be super compelling about what is at stake. Go ahead, this next slide. This is a, a, a slide that, that I, we used to brought this out a couple times when we were dealing with all of our Trayvon Martin stuff and I used that as a teaching and, and, and I was compelled to bring it back, particularly around these labels and categories, because how many of you know that our world creates categories where we put people in boxes? And these boxes are often ascribed certain kinds of, as this diagram says, warmth, meaning people you don't mind being around. Folks just warm your heart. And then competence, meaning that these folk, you don't have a high level of faith in their ability and skill set. They're not very useful. And, 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 and the science has gotten so good now that through tests and all these kinds of exercises, we have been able to measure people's unconscious feelings that bear themselves out physiologically. It's deep, right? So you can be like, oh, you obviously lie test, lie detector test, you could beat the lie detector test. But now they got certain instruments now that can actually track your serotonin levels, the chemicals and all these other chemicals that get high, go higher when you when you have feelings of warmth and go low when you have feelings of coldness toward folk. And I find this to be important, why? Because being a Christian may not necessarily transform your unconscious biases if they are left unengaged. In this diagram, it says there are certain groups of people that we have high warmth toward. Elderly, disabled, mentally challenged. We have warmth towards them, but we have pity as well, meaning that we don't think they have a very high usefulness. So we put them in a box. High warmth, low usefulness. Then we have this esteem group, in group. High warmth, meaning that when you do polls, In our larger society. So white folk and middle class folk and Christians and Americans and housewives. These categories are very kind of, you know, broad, so you know, just kind of go, go with me. And then you go to the one below and you have the envy out group. And these are folk who you don't feel super warm when they come up. But you know that they're very useful. Right? 
rich folk, professional black folk, Jews and Asians. And then the, the last category, these are folk you don't feel warm about, and you don't think they're very useful. Homeless, former felons, undocumented immigrants, poor blacks, welfare queens, and Muslims. Now what's that stake here? What's that stake is that they did the research, they found it when they asked people about, do these people belong in your circle of concern? If you were to draw a circle, and say, these are the people I feel most responsible for, that in many ways, unconsciously, you would make decisions about certain people based off of these kinds of stereotypes. It is unconscious to many of us. So one of the great examples of this is when I was talking to one of the youngsters in the neighborhood, and I asked him, when you see a young white guy walking down the street towards you, do you get fearful? He said, no. Yeah, I mean, he could be like a Ku Klux Klan. No, he, uh, I, I wish he was a Ku Klux Klan. You know how these kids are, you know, they just, I wish he was. He said, there's a reason why I don't take it from the trees when it came again around, right? Because they ain't as bad as them jumping back then anyway, you know. As a kid, you see a young black man on the street, will you be fearful? He's like, well, I certain my guards will go up. I said, okay, what if he just stared at you in the eyes the whole way? He's like, well, you know, I at least I have to ask him, like, what is he looking at? And if he did some threatening, I may have to, like, take him out before he takes me out. Now, this is an unconscious decision that he is arriving at based off of his perception of two folk that may not have any ill will or may have a whole lot of ill will towards him. And it speaks to how all of us are being shaped by unconscious triggers and sometimes conscious experiences that remind us why our appreciation of who people are in the final analysis is so important. If people belong to God, if we all be created in the image of God, then I believe every single child of God must honor the humanity of every single created person. Amen. Regardless of who they are and where they are. And part of what is so great about this, this, this whole exercise that they did is they found out that you can begin to address people's unconscious biases and anxieties by sharing stories and life together. This is the prescription for the church, I believe. That the way you and I overcome difference is not to retreat to our corners. Well, black folk worship over here, white folk worship over here, Latino folk worship over here, rich church work over here, poor church work over here. But we all supposed to hang out in the same space and share our stories and lives together. And in that way, we bear witness that we belong to God. Go to the next slide real quick, because I'm, 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 I'm real long with this service, my goodness, amen. The second thing that the scripture says uh, is that we belong to Christ. Everybody say that we belong to Christ. Now, belonging to God, if you will, is the most kind of broad framework I want to lift up that I think every one of us must aspire and achieve. We belong to Christ speaks to the particularity of the Christian claims of God in the world. Now be clear that Christianity, the worship of Jesus, Yahweh, that predated the kind of Christian narrow uh, 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 religious orientation, if you will, has always been somewhat out of the norm of religious sensibilities. There are only three religions in the history of religion we know of that all worship one God, not many gods. That's Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. So when we say God, I take this from Gregory of Nyssa, another great first, second, third century, third century, hmm, wait, fourth century, he won an early century, guys, and he said that when I say God, I mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Meaning that there's a particular claim towards Christianity, towards belonging to Christ, that all of us must appreciate. Jesus said it like this, I am the one. You are the branches. So you and I belonging to Christ means that there's something particular about who Christ is and what Christ is saying in our lives. And there's a danger in our modern world where 
inclination is to be so open to everything that you have no room for anything. I know some of y'all seen these shows like the horrors. You, know, you walk in a folk house and you, you can't, you, you, just, you just at the door waiting. <laughs> so you know what to do. got magazines from the 70s and whatnot. It's like, I mean, you know, they, 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 they got new 2014 magazines, but I can't, you can't get nothing new in because you got everything else in here. Yeah. How do you know sometimes you have to make a decision yeah. and go deep in your faith? Right? Belonging to Christ means that there's something particular about Jesus that you can't find everywhere else. Right. And the implications of that are important. If you belong to Christ, then he must always have the right of first refusal regarding who or what comes next. Belonging to Christ don't mean that Christ is one of your multiple choice questions. My boo. <laughs> my hood, my race, and then Jesus. Sometimes I pick Jesus, but sometimes, you know, I gotta ride with my hood. I gotta ride with my boo. Ah. The scripture says earlier that you are the temple of God, that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. The Spirit of Christ lives in you. Lord, if I, uh, if I had enough voice in here, I would just preach that to y'all just go and float somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. 
myself and I'll be <laughs> Assumption. 
about each other. We should become or decrease the proximity between us. Because we belong to each other. Yeah. And then that table, we both cry, you know, he cried, you know, I just joined in because I didn't want to feel by myself. <laughs> a super depressed community of them people. And I guarantee you, if you would have met some of them people, they would probably tell you the exact same story I'm telling you about their life. So maybe our enemy is not them people and you people, but it's that bank that took both our houses. It's that prison industrial complex that's locking up both our kids. But against principalities and powers. See, the problem is we think we the enemy. All right. No, you my enemy. You ain't my enemy. You ain't powerful enough to be my enemy. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had. Hey man, it's going to take a whole lot of the devil and hell itself to defeat the people of God. Belonging to each other means that you and I must spend our lives together. Good. You should not have more non-Christian friends than Christian friends. Meaning you should hang out with folks so your faith can be strengthened. I'm not telling you like, you know, count pebbles, you know. <laughs> I got one Christian friend and one non-Christian friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not suggesting. I'm not to have to break something down because I get texts and emails. Well, Pastor, what am I supposed to do about this? <laughs> what I'm saying is that if you are trying to follow the ways of God, make sure that you have a counterbalance. I'd be like swimming with sharks and be mad that Jaws just keep biting you. That's what God So also hang out with some folks that when you get bit, they can help put you back together again. Right. This is why the church exists, folks. To belong. Right. And when we learn to belong, I think the door will be not there. Folks running up in here. There's so many folks who think they don't belong, so they stay out there. Amen. Belonging to culture of death. Right. And isolation. And despair. And hopelessness. But my child, our child, in the 21st century church, in this moment, uh, okay. we belong to God. Yeah. Yeah. We belong to Christ. Yeah. We belong to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Stand with me, everyone.